Hello, all of you fearless listeners. Welcome to Let Fear Bounce. This is Kim Langling, your host of the podcast that brings you inspiration and motivation each week. Join me as I chat with my awesome guests who share their triumphs, their failures, and how they have thrived despite it all. So get ready to be inspired and empowered and to let your own fears bounce. Now let's dive into this episode. Hello everyone, Kim Langling here, your host of Let Fear Bounce. Thanks so much for deciding to spend just a little part of your day with myself today. And it is just myself today. I'm flying solo on this 11th day of September, 2024. Yeah, I'm an American, I'm also a veteran. And this day, one that shaped a generation and those to come, um, you know, our, our world was was uh, slammed. And as the Alan Jackson song went, where were you when the world stopped turning? Yeah, it felt like the world stopped turning that day for me and millions and millions of others. Since that time, it it's not only my generation, but a generation after as well. I mean, there are children who lost loved ones on 9-11 who have grown up and now are now serving their country, or they're now having children of their own. So we're looking at a second generation. It's amazing how time, how quickly time goes, isn't it? But I remember on that day, how, you know, as the world did, it it, it stopped turning. It took our breath away. Um, Toby Keith, Uh, goodness. You know, rest in peace. Um, but Toby Keith, you know, he said we took a sucker punch. And we did. We did. We took a sucker punch. But do you remember, and I don't want to dwell on on all the details and everything that happened. But I do want to talk about, do you guys remember how united this country became? There were flags everywhere. You couldn't go down the street without seeing a flag in someone's yard or on their car, in store windows. People were coming together and caring for one another and helping each other and holding each other up. Their arms were open for their loved ones or friends who had lost someone. We were so united. That doesn't feel like the case anymore. And I often wonder why. All this divisiveness that we have. You know, divisiveness and strife has never served a good purpose. Never served a good purpose. So my thoughts on this day, you know, how united we were. Can we get back to that? You know, and I know I'm just one person. I can't change the world. I know that. And some of you are probably sitting there thinking, oh, listen to her. Wah, wah, wah. No, I'm not wah, wah, wah. I'm not being a cry, baby. I truly want what is best for this country, just like anyone does for their own country. But I want it done with compassion and kindness and love and helping each other up instead of tearing each other down. Stop the finger pointing and name calling and he did this or she said that, blah, 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 blah. Serves no good purpose, never has, never will. In my opinion, in my humble opinion. But when the world did stop turning for a hot minute and then it sped up at tremendous speed and changed a couple of generations of how we live and how we view the world. But at that time, myself and a dear friend of mine, Lori, through our veteran post that's here locally where I live, we decided that, you know, wow, we gotta do something. What can we do from our small slice of the world and maybe have an impact? So we decided, you know, we founded Project Support Our Troops. Now, we had actually been sending packages for a couple of years just to a handful of soldiers that were serving around the globe that were family members of our post members. But then 
9-11 came and I recall her and I being on the phone later on that afternoon, both just devastated, just, oh goodness, just devastated and tearful and dare I say a little fearful, but we both thought, all right, we got to step up our game. We got to do something. We are, there's going to be so many people deploying. We got to do something. What can we do to help those that will be deploying? And we founded Project Support Our Troops. And we have been doing that for 24 years now, folks. But Sending. each and every month, we send care packages to men and women that are serving the United States military all around the globe. 24 years. And everything that we send, including the postage, is done by donations. That's amazing, folks. We are a small veteran post in a small rural community. And let me give you some numbers on this. I don't have exact numbers because we've never really kept complete track, but 24 years, we've been doing this each month, well over, well over 100,000 boxes we have shipped. There were years where we averaged three, 400 boxes a month. There are years we averaged 50 boxes a month. So it all depended on the names that we had and who was deployed and where the names came from. Well over 100,000 boxes. This is what I wanted to actually share that over the years since, since that infamous day, the, the men and women that we have gotten to know and have gotten to actually hug and hold and now consider many of them consider them part of our veteran family over the years has just been tremendous. Oh my goodness. The letters and the emails and the phone calls that we have received from those that receive the boxes that we send such humble thank yous. And some of them will, you know, get you laughing. Some of them will bring you right to tears, but I wanted to share a couple of stories of things that have happened throughout the years you know, some comical and, you know, some just, just tear you, tear you right apart. But I want to share them a little bit because what we're doing is very important. Sending these care packages and, you know, just filled with goodies, um, you know, candy and beef jerky and crackers and snack packs and tuna. And, you know, over the holidays, we try and send them fun holiday stuff so they can decorate their small little tiny space of the world, wherever they may be. And we, uh, over the years, we've had special requests from folks. Maybe it's from an individual soldier, or maybe it's from an actual unit. At times, over the years, we've received requests from the unit chaplains, you know, stating that, you know, their unit is uh, struggling a bit, and they could use a little extra love from home, from across that big pond. So we may get, you know, requests from chaplains, and so we will send boxes to that unit, to each individual. And so it's just been amazing. It's been an amazing journey, but I want to share a couple of stories with you. And one of them is, this is, this is years ago. And I don't remember what year, or how many years ago it was, but we're, we're at a packing and we get so many, so many donations. And so we all, we, we sort all of the donations and then we put them out on tables around our building as a buffet, kind of like a buffet. So when you get your box, you just walk around the tables and fill your box up with all the goodies. And at the end, you set it on a different table and Lori and I tape them up, put letters in them, tape them up, get the labels on and get ready to ship out the door. So this one day we're sorting all of the items that had been donated for that month. And there was a box of hair color. And I looked at it and I went, Lori, are we going to send hair color? Because, you know, it's a specific color. Are we going to send this? She says, you know what? Just toss it in a box. Yes, we'll send it. We'll send it. And if whoever gets it can't use it, they can pass it on to somebody. So, so we put that hair color into a box that was marked for a female. And we have names for these folks. So we were, you know, getting everything shipped and we got it, you know, ready, shipped out the door and several weeks later, we receive a letter from a major, a female major in the military, and she is stationed somewhere overseas in the big sandbox. And she said, thank you so much for the box that you sent. And, you know, she shared it with, with her comrades there, as they all do. And she said, but I can't help but wonder how it is you knew my exact hair color. 
And Lori and I looked at each other as we're reading this. We're going, oh my goodness. She got the hair color that we sent. The one and only time we sent hair color. She says, I can't help but wonder how you knew my exact hair color. I have sent letters to my family members asking them to send me some hair colors just so I can color my hair and feel like a girl again. So I want to thank you for sending that. Um, you know, and all of the other goodies that you sent. Now, Lori and I, we, we just thought that that was awesome, that it was awesome. That one time we send hair color, it gets to a woman and it is her exact color that she has been requesting from her family members. So, you know, little things like that have happened over the years. And that one still makes us chuckle and smile to this day. Another one is um, now, of course, like I just mentioned, we ship boxes, obviously, to females because we have many females serving overseas and in the military. And we have the names. Family members provide their names and addresses to us. So we've not met these people. We just have their names. So we were sending, I don't know, three or four months in a row boxes to Jamie. And we thought it was a female. So each box had feminine hygiene products in it. And we received a very nice letter from a young man named Jamie <laughs> saying, I want to thank you guys so much for the monthly care packages that you're sending me, but I don't understand why you keep on sending me feminine hygiene products. <laughs> this one makes us crack up every time we think about it or talk about it. And we were at a packing and we were sharing that letter with all of the volunteers that come each month to help us pack these boxes. And everyone's just laughing. And many of the folks are veterans and many of them are combat Vietnam veterans. So we read that or Lori read that letter out to all of the volunteers at this one particular packing. And the Vietnam vets were like, wait a minute, he can use all that stuff. We used to ask our moms to send us Tampax and pads. It was pads we'd put on the inside of our helmets as sweat, sweat bands. Or we would put them on the inside of our ankles to keep the sweat from dripping down into our boots to try and keep our feet dry if we were able to. Uh, Tampax they used for cleaning their guns. And one Vietnam combat veteran who actually was a medic, he said, hey, tell them they, you can use those for sucking chest wound. And we're all like, oh, okay. <laughs> So we compiled this list of all the things that the Vietnam vets said that they used that stuff for and said, you know, sent a letter back to this young man saying, we're so sorry. But hey, there are things that you can use these items for. And so we sent that list, you know, with love from the Vietnam vets. So that was pretty darn comical, you know, and we still we still get a kick out of that one too. And, you know, and that's just a couple stories, a couple fun ones, you know, of the, the folks that we got to send to and the letters that we received, most of them are just so heartfelt. And oh my goodness, they're so humble. We're sending them a box of, you know, beef jerky and cheese crackers and peanut butter and nuts and hard candy and cookies and whatever it is that we get in as a donation that month. And they're just overwhelmed by the thought that people they don't even know are sending them boxes and saying that we care for them. And before we pack folks, we always pray. I always put my hands out and say, circle up folks, it's time to pray. And one of the rules before, as we pack, the first rule of thumb is you put love and prayer in that box before you start putting items in that box. So those boxes are always shipped off with love and prayer, which I think is pretty darn cool. Now there's another story and, um, you know, this is one of several, but I'll just share this one because they're not all fun or, you know, make us laugh because this is war that these folks are at. And unfortunately, we lose people. And there was a sergeant, I'm not going to share his name, but there was a sergeant that we received his name and address and we sent him a, a care package and he said, hey, I've got I got 16 guys with me and they're all young and I've been in a while and they call me grandpa. And I don't even think he was 30 yet, but they called him grandpa because he'd been in and for a while and he was in charge of this unit. 
And he said, you know, if you, and some of them don't get mailed off, you, if you could put their names on your list, that'd be so much appreciated. And of course we did. So we added those 16 names and each month we sent them boxes and we received so many amazing letters from these guys. And they were young, they were 18, 19 years old. And uh, we received so many beautiful letters from them thanking us for the stuff that we send. And one Christmas, uh, and we always say in our letters, if there's something we could possibly send you, let us know. We received a request from one of the soldiers saying, you know, I would love to be able to have a Christmas tree. And I don't think that's going to happen over here where we're at, but it would be great if we could. And we received that letter and we went, oh, oh, yes, you can have a Christmas tree. <laughs> so out we went got a three foot Christmas tree and all the trimmings for it. My daughter uh, at the time, I think she was 11, maybe 12 years old. Uh, she made little stockings and put each of their names on those stockings. And she made little tiny angels out of beads and put an angel in each of those stockings with a little note saying, thank you for being my guardian angel. Well, the guys just fell in love with those. Um, I personally burned a bunch of CDs. Yes, I burned CDs, folks. This is how far back I'm talking. I burned CDs on my computer. Um, CDs of every genre of music that you can think of and sent them CDs so they could all, you know, choose what they wanted to listen to. And uh, I actually, um, I made uh, chapstick, like 400 chapsticks. And we sent those off as well. And we sent them wrapped packages, you know, little presents so they could, you know, just something simple that they could open. And we shipped, we shipped Christmas to them. And they were so thankful. And, and the sergeant said, you are not going to believe these guys were acting like they were five years old on Christmas Day when your boxes came because we shipped some big old boxes. And they said they were fighting over the music and the chapstick and all the candy and cookies and goodies. And he said all around, it was just an awesome, awesome day. And he couldn't thank us enough for sending them Christmas. You know, it was just awesome. And we continued to keep in touch with them. Little, We gave them a little special care because they were going through some pretty rough times during their deployment. They were in a very hot spot. And uh, we kept a little closer in touch with this unit. And I received a call one day. I was at work, actually, and I received a call on my cell phone. And I remember looking at the looking at the number thinking, what is, who is this? So told my supervisor, hey, I'm going to step out and take my 10 minute break now. And so I answered. And as I'm walking outside to go on to like, there's a rooftop garage. I was walking outside to get there to take the call. And I answered and I, I'm like, hello, hesitantly, because I didn't know what this number was. <clears throat> Pardon me. And it was the sergeant. And he says, this Miss Kim. And I said, yes, it is. Who's this? And he said, Sergeant, such and such. And I said, are, are you back in States? Are you back home? He said, no, I'm calling from a satellite phone. And I said, you allowed to do that? He said, I, I needed to call you to let you and Miss Lori know something. And I said, okay. And I just knew my heart just dropped. You know, that feeling, it just dropped. And he said, we lost some of our guys today. And he gave me their names. And he said, it was a roadside bomb. And he says, I was thrown clear. But they didn't make it. And he, he was carrying so much guilt because these guys were serving under him. And he felt that, you know, he was not able to protect all of them. And I said, when did this happen? And he said, just a few hours ago. And I said, oh my goodness, I don't think you're supposed to be calling me. He said, no, I'm out behind the Quonset hut. And I just wanted to let you and Miss Lori know because you have been our angels and you have been what has been keeping us sane over here. And I figured you'd want to know but I got to go now. And he hung up and I'm standing there on the rooftop garage at work, holding my phone and tears just started streaming. 
like they're going to do now. <laughs> um, because we'd been keeping in such close contact with these guys, you know, through letters and boxes and emails. And this sergeant would let us know weekly what was going on with the guys. You know, if one was struggling or maybe one's wife sent him a Dear John letter. So we would send that guy an extra box with a little extra love. I mean, just things like that. You know, we really, this this whole unit, we just took under our wings as much as we could from this side of the pond. And to hear that we had lost several of them um, was just crushing. And uh, a day later, I received an email from this sergeant saying, you know, hey, I apologize for for dumping on you like I did when I called. I should have never done that. Um, but I just, you know, he goes, I was just so overwrought and I knew that you and Lori would want to know. He goes, but I also want to let you know that somehow we're going to make you and Miss Lori a part of the memorial service that we're currently planning for these guys. And I'll let you know how that goes. And I just read this email and then I shared it with Lori and we're like, wow, they don't need to do that. We're, you know, um, and then it was a couple days later. I receive another email from the sergeant with a photograph. And it gets me every time. <sighs> photograph was, as, was of him and the remainder of that unit standing near the weapon with the boots and the helmet and the dog tags at the memorial. And they're holding a sign that says, thank you, Kim and Lori. Goodness, still gets me all these years later. And it's been a hot minute, folks. It's been a while. Um, we were, Lori and I were so ridiculously humbled by that. So humbled. We did keep in touch with them. For the rest of their deployment. They were there for quite a while. They were there for quite a while. And uh, kept in touch with them. And when they were all rotating home, they were so excited, you know. And we never heard from any of those guys again, except for the sergeant. And he did keep in touch for a while. And then uh, received another call from him. This is probably a year after they were all home. And he called. And again, I'm out on the rooftop garage. <laughs> and I said, Sergeant, good to hear from you. How are you doing? And he said, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. I can't stop hearing them. I can't stop seeing their faces. I can't do it anymore. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. So I immediately start praying to God as I'm listening to him. Father God, what am I supposed to say to him? I think he's on the brink of taking his own life. Oh my gosh. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And the only thing, what came to me, I was like, Sergeant, you most certainly can keep on going on. And I kept calling him Sergeant. I didn't call him by his name. Like he'd asked me to <laughs> when they first rotated home, uh, I kept calling him Sergeant. And I, I was yelling at him. You most certainly can carry on Sergeant. And, uh, The call ended abruptly with him. I mean, he wasn't mad at me because I was yelling. Uh, he was he was very, very, very distraught. He was in a very, very dark place. And he just said, I got to go. I just wanted to say thank you once again to you and Lori, because you, you literally were our guardian angels and you kept us sane that whole time that we were deployed. And I just wanted to say thank you one more time. And then he hung up. Didn't hear from him. Tried calling him back. No answer. Lori tried calling him. No answer. I tried calling where he was currently stationed. And of course, I'm not a family member, have no need to know. So they didn't give me any information if he was even still there. Um, but I shared my concern. So I'm hoping that that was taken the right way on their end and looked into. Two weeks later, two weeks, and I know I'm rambling. Um, two weeks later, receive a call from the sergeant saying, hey, I saw I had missed calls from you. Sorry, I, I couldn't catch your call, um, but I want to see how you're doing. You know, what's going on? And I said, Sergeant, the last time I talked to you, you were very, very distraught. I honestly thought you were getting ready to take your own life. And he says, oh, I was. 
He goes, but I don't remember calling you. I don't remember talking to you. He goes, when was that? And so I'm looking back on my phone and I tell him what day and time. And he said, Kim, that's the day I, I actually admitted myself into the hospital because I scared myself because I did want to take my own life. He goes, I've been in the hospital a couple of weeks and I just got out and saw that I had missed calls from you. So I wanted to, you know, make sure things okay. I'm like, oh my gosh. I go, do you have any idea how much you scared me? <laughs> but uh, it was, we were so thankful that he was okay. Um, and that was actually the last time we heard from him. And to this day, this is years later, to this day, I hope he's doing all right. I do. I hope he's doing all right. But, you know, it's things like that, folks. You know, so, so many people, so many stories, so much history over the last 24 years of Project Support Our Troops. And it all began really, really, really ramped up on this day. All those years ago. Do we wish it could be different? Yeah. And I bet you there's so many families out there that wish the same. But since it isn't, we do what we can. And we do it in love, with compassion and kindness. Not divisiveness, not harsh words. Not tearing each other down. But a handout to help each other up. And to hold each other up when needed. That's what this day. All of that that I just shared, I know I just rambled. Boom, boom, boom. Um, and maybe you're not even still listening. But uh, that's what this day each year brings to mind all these men and women that we've kept in touch with over the years, all the family members that we've sat with at the funerals of their loved ones that didn't make it home, the welcome home parties that we've attended of those who did come home safe and sound, the family members that we've held as they've cried because they missed their family member or they're so very worried. And it's so hard to keep the home fires burning on their end. They're working full time and they got young children and it's just them now. And, you know, how do I get the, the, the driveway plowed during the winter? I don't have a plow. I don't know how to do that. We can't afford to, to hire somebody to do little things like that. So it's not just the boxes that we ship. It's, it's what we do back here on this side of the pond too. We support the family members as well. And they in turn support us by coming to the packings each and every month. It's fellowshipping, you know, it's just, I mean, it's just amazing. We've all become family members over these years and some have come and gone, come and gone, come and gone. And then we've got the some, some that stayed with us. They have been with us the entire 24 years. It's amazing. It truly is amazing, folks. And the love and compassion and passion that we have for this project I know you're out there listening. You probably have something like that that you're passionate about. This just veterans and those who serve just happen to be my passion. But, you know, you know how it feels if you've got something you're passionate about, a cause, an organization that you're part of. You know that feeling in your heart. And that that thing that keeps you going and wanting to keep on going. You know, every time we get receive a letter saying, thank you so much, you have no idea how this made my day or you guys, this your box made me smile. And it's the first time I smiled in days. Or you sent me this. Oh my gosh, I can't. I haven't had this candy since I was a kid. You, you know, just you just made my day. It was awesome. Little things like that, folks. That's what keeps us going because it's not easy keeping something like this going for so long. And it's all done by donations. Sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes it's heartbreaking. Sometimes we don't think we can do it anymore. Maybe we don't have enough stuff coming in or physically or mentally. We're, we're tired because it hurts sometimes a lot. But then we receive one of those letters or one of those emails or a family member shows up at a packing and says, my husband just sent me a letter and I got to share it with you. And it just, you know, that's what keeps us going. So on this day, Think of what, you know, what is it that you can do to show love, compassion, and kindness to someone else? Someone who uh, may have a loved one serving right now. Someone maybe to someone who lost a loved one over 20 years ago on that day. 
I know those, those kids are growing up and married and having kids of their own, you know, I mean, what a legacy, but what is it that you can do in your own small slice of the world to make it better? We can all be nuggets of hope. That's how I want to wrap this up. Filled with hope. Is this day somber? Yes. Yes, it is. And my flag is flying at half staff. And I have said a special prayer. And I will say another one at the end of this day. But where you are at in your small slice, you can make a difference by being a nugget of hope. Be a nugget of hope, folks. This world sorely needs it. So you can be your own nugget of hope and change your own neighborhood, your own community, one person at a time. If you're a veteran, I would like to thank you for your service. And I know it sounds, you know, so trite and it just seems so simple, but it is a heartfelt thank you. Thank you for all that you have given and sacrificed. Because there are many, many of us know who know how hard it is to leave your loved ones and go serve your country. Because you worry too. You've got a job to do, but you still worry about your loved ones back home on this side of the pond. We know that. So thank you for all that you have given and continue to give. I want to thank those who will soon be giving their time and serving their country. God bless you all. God bless you all. And God bless this country. And on this day, 9-11-2024, take just a moment to reflect and be thankful. Be thankful that we have those who are ready to step into harm's way to keep us safe. That is no small deal, folks. That is no small deal. I wish you all a blessed day. This is Kim Langley, your host of Let Fear Bounce. Everybody be well, stay well, and above all, be blessed. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Let Fear Bounce. I do realize that your time is precious, and I appreciate that you've decided to spend just a small part of your day with myself and my guest. I hope that you found inspiration and motivation tucked into this conversation today. And remember, every triumph and failure is a step towards thriving. So stay fearless, stay inspired, and join me each week with more inspiration from amazing guests from all over the world. Until then, stay fearless, my friends, and let fear bounce.